Hello and well met guys. This is Laird with the Fantasy Grounds Academy. Today I'm going to mostly cover extracting images, whether it be for your homebrew game or perhaps you're in the middle of a big project. So one of the neat things that I had come across um, over a year ago, I believe there was a Kickstarter for this Hecna setting, which is kind of a gothic horror kind of traveling carnival Essentially, you get trapped there, you got to find your way out, that sort of thing. I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but that's the gist of it. There's a lot to this. Um, if you were part of this Kickstarter, it was huge. I'm not really here to necessarily advertise Hecna, but if you're interested in a campaign like this, I advise checking it out. Um, there are discount codes, so this price that you're seeing on the screen, you can take off $5 if you find a discount code, and it's pretty easy for you to do that. Um, this is just a PDF edition, but it has a whole heck of a lot of uh, content. I mean, there's dice, music. Matter of fact, the music I'm playing right now in the background is part of the soundtrack that you get. And then you have all these extras that are physical. So this is basically the content. I just wanted to show you where I got this from. It's not yet in Fantasy Grounds. I don't know if anyone's working on it. It's not in the queue, so I have no idea. But uh, I did put out a inquiry with Smiteworks to see if, if they're are and with uh, hit point press see if they want to get it in there but anyways <clears throat> long story short <clears throat> what I'm going to be doing is taking the images out of this beautiful PDF <clears throat> so there are a ton of photos in this this thing is a beast it's like over almost 300 pages it's pretty well put together there's a lot to be loved in this lots of art lots of different things that might interest you. Um, what I do like is they have a shuffling card system, which essentially lets you change the change up the path of the players take for missions. It has its own language. I mean, they have a font. I mean, it's, uh, it's crazy. But they, they basically get into um, basically how this thing rolls out. I mean, it's not really a review of the product, but I just wanted to show you where the source, where the information is coming from. So I want to get all these images out. Traditionally, what you would do is right-click, copy the image, paste it into a program, and edit it. So that's okay if you only got like two or three um, actual pieces of art. But this has got like several hundreds of different uh, amounts of art in here. So depending on the program that you use, uh, you can extract images out of PDFs if they're not protected. Some of them are locked, so you won't be able to do that. But most of them are not, especially after you purchase. So I purchased this online. And what I'm going to be doing is taking the images out to be used in Fantasy Grounds and then organizing those and then converting them. So first step is to kind of size up the PDF and like I said it's over 300 pages a lot of the stuff that gets taken out from the back end of this is probably not required but you will get a, a sense of you know the the enormity of this so I've already done that I wanted to show you the the art that comes in it it's crazy so let's see this is just the the main picture this is like kind of like your advertising um, logo type thing, and then I took out, I kind of uh, took out the uh, this background and use added information for making the overlay that I'm using right now. So this overlay is how I built the uh, essentially how I built that is using the assets out of the PDF, and then I used a couple of my own. <clears throat> and let's see. The next thing is, uh, let's go into, I wanted to show you the actual images folder. So I extracted a whole bunch of images out of here. and it, it was a ton. And then there's also a folder here that has all the PDFs are, and the uh, licensing for the music. There's a music folder. So it's pretty, I mean, it's a lot. There's a lot of stuff in there. So what we're going to do is extract the images out. So I already have a program that I use personally because I don't own the Adobe Suite. But it's going to take the PDF file and I assigned an art output folder. And then the base name for the images, what I can do is change them. So what I might do is change this to say um, Hecna. Uh, 
and then underscore whatever, you know. So this way, this is the base name for the images that are coming out. So I might just say Hecna underscore art, something like that. So that'll be the base name so that all of the images will get that inherited. And then base name number. So extracted images will be named base name and then number dot ext. So the number is a sequence and the ext is the file type. So JPEG or BMP if you want it to be. So I'm going to say Hecna underscore art. And then um, I'll put uh, 01 or underscore 01 dot JPEG. Something like that. You could do that if you want. But this is just to give you an idea. So base name. Okay, number sign. Okay. So anyways, you get the idea. Um, so that's just a program that I have. It's called PDF Extraction Wizard. So that is a really cheap, like, $20 program. Now it's, I think it's freeware now. So you don't even have to pay for it. But when I bought it, it was a long time ago. But it does what I want it to do. So, so this is just where you assign the PDF. So I'm going to assign it here. Like I said, this is the output. Let's see if that does anything. Yeah, Hecna Handbook. And then I'm going to put... There we go. I'm going to put art in front of it. And then this, I want to change this to art. That way it doesn't get mixed in with everything else. So this is just a tool that I use to help get this out or to, you know, to help get it out of the program. So there we go. And then I can do browse if I want to. So if I go into Hecna, I'm going to Hecna 2. That's the folder I'm going to put it in. I hit next. Um, if you want to lock this, you can for the PDF options. So now what it's doing is it's going to go through every single page and unlock all of the, or unlock, uh, extract all the images it extracted 692 images. So we're going to have it open that up and see what we got here. So these are all the images that comes out of this particular um, this particular PDF. So the next step in this process is pretty kind of a, uh, critical. So um, to organize what you what you have to do for your project is I think the best approach, at least for um, for this type of work is to go ahead and arrange, take the time to reorganize these images. So some of these I won't need, like, but I'll keep them in a separate folder, like all these little embellishments here, like these little markers and these, what they use to lay out the PDF. I'll put all that stuff in a separate folder. And then all these little images here, Anything that's square will go in like a square type folder. Anything that's rectangular will go in either a horizontal or a vertical uh, folder. So I'm going to go ahead and um, right click. I'm going to make some new folders. So we're going to call this um, horizontal. And then the other one's going to be vertical. And the reason I'm doing this is so that when you go to resize them and you go to um, organize them for Fantasy Grounds, you can take and put them in a um, kind of like a, a script or, or a batch and run them all in a batch instead of doing it um, one at a time or, you know, doing it in multiple steps. So what I'm doing is a little bit of work up front. So this is just for kind of an ease of use kind of thing in the you know, as you're doing your work, you kind of want to develop a workflow. 
And I found this works best for me. I mean, if you only got a couple images, who cares? But when you got a large project like this, or you got a several images that you want to organize, this will help with that a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and add another folder. So this is going to be square. So there's three folders, and essentially I'm just going to go through the library here and decide which ones are going to be which. So for instance, um, the ones that are vertical oriented, I'm going to put those in a ver vertical folder. So something like this would go in the vertical folder. This is vertical. So just going through each one of these, it is a little bit of work, but I think in the long run, it's totally worth it. Because like this will help when you go to convert a file, it will just help you. So like this one, I'd probably make it horizontal. So this is just a way to uh, make it so that the images are going to be roughly oriented the same direction. And then when it goes to resize these in for Fantasy Grounds or for whatever your project is, it'll make it easier on you so you can actually do a batch conversion script that is going to only size from the longest size. So if you're going to do horizontal, you would do the horizontal size and base it off of that. If you're going to do vertical, then you'd base it off the vertical side. So this why I'm sorting these out, why I would t even take the extra time to do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't even bother. But this is a, a practice that you'll learn in time that will help you speed up your process and make it not such a burden to yourself um, when it comes to uh, converting. So anything with maps, I'm going to actually put those in a separate folder. <clears throat> And then all this weirdness here, I don't, I'm not going to even worry about that. I'll put that in a separate folder because I might use those for the, um, if you make a reference manual. So all these like background textures and all these little odds and ends, I'll use those for like, you know, for, for creating something for the actual book or inside the reference manual. So all I'm doing right now is just taking in anything that looks like a square it'll go there anything that looks like a vertical will go in there so here's uh let's see is that a that's actually a square but this one i'll put in the uh vertical just in case actually no that was uh horizontal or square excuse me so i'll put that back in here square so that's basically the idea behind this is so that when you're going to convert your content, everything is kind of in its place. You don't have a bunch of stray images and a bunch of different spots. And it's going to be a lot easier for you to do this work if, if you're going to do the conversion in Fantasy Grounds. That way, you know, it doesn't take forever in a day. Doing this part of it is a little bit annoying. Like, it, you know, there's a lot to do especially when you got this many images to so make this process even quicker. You know, I could take and um, highlight the stuff that I want, drag them in there. But as I'm talking through this, I'm also explaining the, you know, the, the philosophy behind it and that sort of thing. So um, you get tired of me rambling. You can always fast forward the video if you're watching this in the future, but it, you know, it's just a, a sense of getting organized and making this easy for you to do. And, and not so difficult or so painstakingly um, painful uh, when you're doing conversions because it, it can be annoying, very, very annoying. So I want to take out some of that annoyance and that's why I'm sharing this with you. Um, this part of it is tedious. I get it. I mean, not everyone has time to sit here and do this type of thing, but <clears throat> if you, I'm just promise you that if you do this, it's going to take a lot less time in the back end. So you do the work up front and on the back end, things get a lot easier. It really does make a difference in your workflow and how things turn out. So a lot of these are, I notice our vertical orientation, which is fine. But that's kind of the idea is to sort all this stuff out. And I like that some of these already have the, the they could potentially already have the backgrounds out of them, but I'm not too worried about that. These are all JPEGs, by the way. So that's going to be a lot of extra work on me uh, to do that part of it. But 
I have apps on my phone and I have other things I can use that'll make that much quicker than doing it this way. But this is just one option. There are several ways to do this where it will extract all these out with the background already removed out of it. But, you know, I like to beat my head against the wall, so there's that. But, you know, this is just kind of a standard um, standardization of your process is kind of what I'm get heading toward because it really does help like when I first started doing these conversions doing these work and I'm doing it for myself mostly so I obviously I want to make this easier on myself I mean if nothing else so I could go through here and just hold down the control key and then highlight just the ones that I think I need to pull into the you know into that folder and then take and drag these in instead of doing it you know onesie twosie you do something like that and then just take that and drag a group of them in there instead of doing one at a time you could do that too so it just depends on your your process but essentially that's what you're going to be doing in the beginning is getting all this artwork organized so that it's easier to deal with in fantasy grounds the the uh the, the benefit of this is like, for instance, if you're going to do like all these square images, you can take like a batch file, a conversion and change all this out so that it's a lot easier for you to, to, uh, you know, to convert it. So that, that, or at least to change the format and the size, if you want to do it that way. So like, for instance, um, in GIMP, you can run a batch file. So this is a, a plugin called BIMP, which is a, um, a batch conversion extension. It's free. And I think I have some of these resources and other videos I've done, and it's free. You can find this online. It's BIMP with a B. So this is the plugin. And what you can do is you can add the manipulation set. So in this case, we want to, um, we're going to change the format and compression. So we're going to go from JPEG to WebP. And we're going to change the image quality to 75 as per the, the Atlassian guide, because that's what they recommend. That helps keep the file size down, especially when you have several of them. So that's why they have you do that. It isn't even so much about handling it on a computer, but it is about storage and about transferring that file back and forth and the actual size of the adventure. So if you go to download it like from the Fantasy Crown store or during the updates, it would take forever if all of these were at high quality. So that you have to kind of find a happy medium and that's kind of what that is. So this is gonna change the format and the compression and the image quality. And then you can add another manipulation set where maybe you wanna resize it. So what you can do here is you can take the aspect ratio. So in this case, this was, let's see, make sure I got, this is going to be for the, we'll say for the horizontal. So we're going to leave that there for now. And instead of percent, I'm going to change that to pixels because that's how I want to size it. And the only thing I'm going to worry about is the width. And the guidelines for handouts and those sort of things that are not necessarily maps is right around a thousand. So all I'm going to do is change this width to a thousand and leave it at that. And then this will hopefully, um, it'll basically change with it. So uh, if you want the, you want to preserve the aspect ratio. So that's another thing is you, you can preserve the aspect ratio. So when you go to resize, instead of stretch, we're going to go to preserve. And then I'll go to pixels. And then if I change this height or width, it should change with it. Huh. I don't know why it's doing that. But anyway, so that that's basically what I'm trying to do. And then for the resolution, I'll go with 100 that's what most of these require and I don't want to change the height in this case only the width so preserving the aspect ratio is is the main goal 
and I don't want to um, change the height to anything. So once you're done with that, you can hit OK. So now I have two different uh, manipulation sets. So one of them is going to change the format and the quality of the compression, and the other one's going to change the size. So right around a thousand, and then also, um, you know, doing just one side basically. And I hit apply. It's going to ask me to add the images. So I can t do this by single images, or I can do it by folder. So in this case, I'm going to do it by folder, and in my Hecna 2 folder, I have the horizontal folder where all the horizontal images live. And I want to keep this hierarchy, and for the output, I'm going to say um, use the selected files output as location. So I'm going to go ahead and select this Hecna folder, and then I'm going to go back to the horizontal folder. Sometimes I'll make a subfolder because every once in a while you'll get like data corruption because you're writing and you're erasing at the same time in the folder that you're working in. But it, it prioritizes it, but once in a while it kind of goofs up. So sometimes it's better to put it in a different subfolder instead of the same folder. But in this case, I'll leave it in the same and I just hit apply. And it's going to go through and work through all those images. It's going to resize them. It's going to change the format, all those things. We'll see how it turns out. But I left the um, the vertical. I just made that at 1,000. And then the other part, I, I left that at zero because I don't want to affect that. So after all of it has been processed, it'll let you know if you had any errors. One of the things you want to be careful with this particular plugin with GIMP is if you're going to do maps, you're going to probably have to do one or two at a time. I tried to do like four different maps at once that were really huge. I was trying to convert them and make them smaller, and it just choked this out. So you kind of have to be careful with maps. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Let's say no. Okay, so hit close. And now we'll go to the folder and take a look, see what the damage was. So here's the horizontal. And now that if I look here, it has the WebP format on it. So, yep. Oh, look what it did. <laughs> it made it tiny. So I didn't have the script correctly. This is a two by one uh, dimension. But yeah, I didn't change the, the other part of it very well. But nonetheless, you get the idea that you can take this and convert. So I'll have to redo my batch manipulation. Or you can leave it the original size, and you can also just do it that way. So you can do this in a batch. But the idea was to have it to where you're, you can take those images and, and essentially make them to a certain size. And that way, when you go to resize them like this, it'll do it all at once instead of having to manually do it for every single image. So I kind of goof that up. But anyhow, this is just a, a way that you can help preserve the images and make it a little easier on you when you're doing these kind of research. So let me go back to the resize thing. I got to revisit this. So. 100% by 100%. I don't want it by percent. I want it by pixels. And I did say to preserve the aspect ratio. So I wonder what happened there. Maybe it's because I turned this other one to zero. But I don't want to um, disturb the, the actual... Um, height of these images so we'll see what happens so that's that and then we'll go back to changing the format and the compression to webp and like i said you do 75 and this is according to the website so if you need i'm going to include that particular help um, file that's or help portal for the uh, fantasy grounds atlassian so that'll help with, with that sort of thing. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel. It gives you an idea of the sizing for for the actual um, content. So that's that. 
So we wanted to keep the folder hierarchy and then I outputted it to the same folder. That might have been part of the issue too, but we'll see. We'll see if that helps. So basically you're just taking um, the parameters that you want to affect. And that's what the manipulation set is. And then you will take and say, okay, I want everything on this part of this half of it to only, I only want to convert just the, you know, the one side. You can also do that with other, um, other things too. So we'll head and hit close. And we'll see if that fixed the problem that I was having. Yeah, so this looks right. So I just had to leave that other side alone. Let's see what size this image is. Um, so this is the JPEG. And this thing is 323 kilobytes. This is a uh, WebP. And this is at 752 by 480. So this is nice. Yeah, so these are more digestible. Let's see what it looks like and see if it's distorted or not. Yeah, so that looks right. So it takes that image and it will compress it down. So we don't know what the starting size was necessarily, but I know most of them ranged around 1,000 anyways. But when you do this to them, you can manipulate each one of them to a certain orientation and percentage, or you can do uh, pixels in this case, and that will convert these all down to whatever format you want. There are other tools that will do this more effectively. I'm just using the free tools. I have Corel, so I would probably use something like that, which is even a little bit more powerful. But you get the idea that you can actually take and put a whole series of images in your photo editing software and extract the images. And then the main takeaway here is to put them in certain folders so that you're not reinventing the wheel as far as where they go and how they're, you know, how they're set up in, in the uh, orientation part of this. So I would go through the rest of these and probably re-perform that that compression play with that see where i'm at on, on the sizing and then like for the rest of the stuff you know i would just get it all organized into these three folders then i'd run your batch manipulation on each folder that way you can keep preserve the aspect ratio but just worry about one side of it so in the square obviously you wouldn't have to do anything but convert those probably just won't you know keep the same everything just maybe go to a thousand and then this stuff, but that also includes the canvas. So if you have, you know, a bunch of space around it, it's going to calculate that too. So you got to remember, but at least they'll all be kind of uniform as far as sizing goes. So if you're going to resize images, you can base it off the original image. It'll take all this dead space, calculate that in there too. So whatever the original image size was, you can bump it up to a thousand on the vertical side in this case. And then the other side will um, maintain the aspect ratio. So we don't care what the second side is as long as it's proportional. So that is just a, a way to kind of make this a little easier. So I wouldn't do that for maps. So something like this, I, comp I would leave it as is. Probably just convert from JPEG or PNG to WebP and then leave it at that. Because I wouldn't want to mess with the aspect ratio on here. Because that tends to be what breaks these maps. That's why these lines don't line up. Because when if you, the minute you start stretching these and, and moving stuff around, that's when these are off. Then they are no longer square. They become rectangles. And it gets harder to fix that. Then you have to use a tool like map align or, or start over, basically. So just kind of keep that in mind with maps. I wouldn't play too much with the dimensions. I would more worry about the compression on it. And then if you have to resize it, it's probably best you just break it up into four pieces or something like that. So if this was too big of an image and I didn't want this huge, all this background information, I'd probably just cut out these individual maps and then take this map itself and make this like a DM map and then just link all these rooms to it and then use those as my battle maps instead of having one huge map. 
probably just have what those are six one two three four five yeah so six different maps plus this kind of tie-in map over here which would just be the base image and i would just link all these to it so it's organized and then these smaller maps would be like player maps so or you can make them tiles so this is the only thing i don't like is this is a lot of wasted space out here i think they could have made this like <laughs> could have cut this off and this and made this a smaller image but that's just me being nitpicky but there there's a few maps in here i don't think i would treat those the same way i would for uh the images that are coming um, from art and, and those sort of things i'd separate those images out so here's like the the regional map and see this is broken into pieces so it fits in the pdf so i'd probably just take something like this <clears throat> butt it up together and then i would just make it one image size it to maybe maybe this one i'll make it around 2k maybe around 2000 so as i want to show the map or in this case i probably wouldn't show this because this has all the locations on it so if this is a gm map i'd probably make this smaller if it was, was a player map i would take these numbers out and you could do that by painstakingly removing them or finding another version of it that doesn't already have the numbers on it. I don't know if there is such a one, but th this is just kind of some tips that you'll learn or some things that you'll struggle with along the way. <clears throat> a lot of good art in this book. So I'm pretty pleased with that. So there is some things in here that I may not use like this, all this confetti stuff. I use that a little bit in, in places, but I don't think I need all that. So I probably put all these little embellishment things in a separate folder. So I might call those decorations, something like that. And then I'll pull those in as I need them. If I'm building a, um, you know, like a reference manual and I want like a fancy little accent, or maybe I'll use those in GIMP or in, in my case, I used it in Canva. So if I go to my Canva account, I can take and put that kind of thing in there. So Canva's a pretty neat program. It does quite a bit of stuff. So this is just some of the stuff I was doing earlier. Just so you can see the, the, the editing processes. Processes. Let's see. This was the. This is how I made the overlay. So like I said, I put all these little assets in here. And then I was working on a, um, a thing in GPT if you guys like that kind of thing. And I was taking this, uh, basically the, the Hecna artwork and stuff and playing around with that. Man, it's going to make some minions for the, uh, for the bad guys in here. So it just kind of depends on, um, you know, like what your needs are. <clears throat> but here's some of the circus designs that I'd come up with through, uh, I mean, I didn't do it, but GPT did. So you kind of get the idea of where I was headed anyways. Um, this is just a, some work that I was looking at. So this is this turned out really good. So I might use something like this. So in this case, I might take something like this and go back into here. And let's see. I'm going to add Something like that, and then take all these things, little accents out. And let's see, I want to add a blank page and hit Control V. So you can do something like that, and then use this guy and kind of use this as some background image of my own. So if you want to homebrew it, you can do something like that. And this has a really good. Um, uh, background removal tool so if you need to do that so if I take this and take this thing here and I'm gonna go to uh, transparency you can turn down the opaqueness if you want or in this case I'm gonna edit the photo and then go into background remover so it'll take out some of the background yeah it looks like it did a pretty good job so I'll leave it at that Yep, that's fine. So it does a pretty good job. You can see kind of like right in here 
or you'd have to take that out, but it did a majority of the work. So that's kind of cool. But there are other programs that do a better job with that. That's not too bad for the first pass. But you get the idea where you can take stuff like that and add them into your art if you want to. Or you can take something existing from the art that comes with it. Ahoy! Uh, Dan, what's going on? So this is just a, a you know, pro preliminary work that I was doing on on the uh, Hecna setting. And being that it's a personal project, you can add whatever you want. That's another thing I like about homebrew stuff is you don't have to worry too much about, you know, who you're trying to please except for yourself. And I go all out. Like, I'll put tons of add-ons and stuff there. So I might use this as my... Maybe I'll say this is heck now, or maybe this is his minion or something. Who knows? But this thing here, I definitely cut out this background if I wanted to. And then it, you can go in and edit it, like I was showing it earlier, like how it didn't take out some of the stuff around the hands. So if you have to, you can go in and take out this stuff. It turn down the brush size. You kind of come in here and take out take out stuff you don't want like here in between these fingers you can see where it's kind of the anyways you get the idea you can you can edit this stuff i don't like that it's not it doesn't allow you to do finer finer detail but it does a pretty good job it's not bad so maybe do something like that and then uh, some of the art that comes with it let's see what did i do here so yeah, so there was some popcorn and some confetti, and like this is the the background I used for the that I generated with AI. So you can do something like that. Send this thing back to the background, and you use this for your um, kind of like the foreground. And one thing, a trick that I use if I don't have a photo editor, and this is this kind of is a photo editor, but it's not as good as like um, Photoshop or something like that. So there's some things that can go wrong here. So for instance, this light source coming from over here doesn't make any sense because this is a nighttime picture and then you have this light coming from God knows where. And then it kind of looks like he's floating as opposed to to being a part of the photo. So one of the thing I've done I've done over the years is like kind of like hide his feet. So you can't really tell that he's floating on air. And it kind of looks more like he's blended blended into the background. And then um, there's some things in here that I uploaded from the original art. So I might take like this, this, and maybe the popcorn. And then go back to the elements here. And use these as you know, parts of the art. And this will help me blend in his feet. Since they kind of don't make sense. So you can do stuff like that. So like here's the popcorn. So you can put that right there in front. Like make it look like he's, you know, he's standing there and then there's some spilled popcorn in front of his feet. So this kind of gives you the illusion that it's more a part of the original image. Hey, pretty good, Dan. <laughs> so this is... Uh, one thing and then another thing i'll do is i'll turn the transparency down just a hair and what that does is it helps take the edges off the uh art so it doesn't look like it's popping out unless that's what you want so i just take just a tiny bit of that kind of feathers it into the background so it's not so obvious that it you know it's from a different source that kind of helps a little bit and then playing with the lighting so I don't like this. It's kind of bright for, I mean, yes, I want to see this person or this individual, but I don't necessarily think, yeah, if it is a mimic, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's scary. But this is, uh, so like I turn the brightness down a little bit. That kind of helps blend it in with the background. I kind of like that actually. So turn the brightness down just a hair, maybe turn the contrast down a little bit. So you can play with lighting to a point to where it kind of helps you and take out a little bit of the white bring up the blacks a little bit 
there's some shadow so that kind of helps it kind of you know kind of helps it blend a little better and that way it's not so dr drastic you know like the the coloring and the shadow so that blends into the photo a little better when you play with the light uh, it's not that great there's other programs that will basically look at the background it'll look at your image and it will help match it up better but in this case i'm not gonna worry about so like there's a little here's something random that i just found um this comes with a graphic that comes with um with this but i might put like something like that as an accent and then being that it's kind of bright and white i might turn down the transparency a little bit so it kind of blends in better and it doesn't look like an image just slapped on top it actually looks like it's part of the reflection off of that mace that he's carrying there. So this is just kind of things you can do with images and such. But the main takeaway here was to organize the images, put them in here in, in by orientation. So like I said, you, you would take and make folders for horizontal images, square images, vertical, and then maybe one for maps. So I'll make a subfolder for our maps because you don't want to resize those if you can help it. So I might just say maps here and then any maps that I find I'll drag and drop those into that folder. Yeah so here's maps. I'm going to sort by type. There we go. So this is just gives you a, a kind of a organizational tool essentially to to make it so like when you're doing these conversions it's a lot easier to do like this one's square you'll get the hang of it after a while you'll start to realize oh this would be much easier if i just put all these together so like here's a map i believe yeah so that you might use this for a battle map so i put that in the maps folder and this is after i've extracted everything so like I said, I'll put all the maps together. But like this map here that I was showing you earlier, that's broken up into two pieces. So I might put that in Canva. So let's uh, add another image here. Go into my folder. And drag those into Canva. Kind of fix those up. So maybe you want to take something like this. Join those back together. Yeah, it is a pretty cool adventure. I'm, I'm going to do a little bit more with it. I might convert it. I don't know if it's going to be worth my time or not, but I'll at least do it for myself. And the main reason I do this for practice. I'm not really necessarily looking for prestige or, you know, wealth or anything because you're not going to get wealthy doing this. But I do want to kind of take this information and share it with you guys, kind of give you some some tips and help so when you guys take on a project yeah so that looks pretty good so you can join stuff together if you want and this overlay is you know it's probably too big so in canva you can you can take this and change the sizes so i already have um, presets for 1000 by 800 and then i have 1000 by 1000 and then 800 by 1000 so those are my kind of like my preset so when i go to resize images i can do it that way too i can do it all at once in canva one image per screen um size it change it you know edit it whatever i need to do and then when i go to export it i can tell it to um, make it a transparency and the background will already be taken out so it, in reality i'd probably take these things and size those in here instead of using that other program that that just extracts the images out. I already got the images out. So now what I'm going to do is take all of those and put them in Canva and put them in certain categories and then resize them all together. Some really cool art. Like this thing here, I use this on the uh, on the uh, overlay. So I'll show you where I put that. So like put it right here, in which I thought was kind of a cool spot for it because it looks like he's crawling out of the screen. So I thought that was kind of cool. But yeah, I kind of using that as as embellishments, like these lights here. I use those up here. I took this graphic from the main website. That's the publisher. 
This is the title. I took that out of that one screenshot. You guys know where this came from. It's might works. You know, so this just, uh, you know, kind of a way to make this interesting. So you could do something like this. Like you have this, this graphic that I took out of the original PDF. Take that and put this back here. It looks like it's too big. It starts getting distorted if you go beyond the original size. And then I'll move that to the background. So instead of that being right there in front of his face, I can just go ahead and go to position and go backwards or forward. <laughs> but see what I would do in that case is I'd take this guy Let's see, copy, paste. And then what you do is you can layer this on top. So you don't, so if you need to get this guy out of the picture, but you don't want to mess with the picture too much, you can do something like that. Something like that. You get the idea. See, I stretched them out a little, so I'd have to line it up better. But use this to kind of make it a little bit more useful to you. And there you go. And it, for some reason, even though that's a different image, it kind of gives you more options when you can pull these out. Because then I can put a little glow on it if I wanted to. So this, you know, if I wanted to edit the photo a little bit more, maybe go to shadows go to glow i could put this like kind of like this black shadow i try to turn it down a little bit because i don't like it to be too too noticeable so i just barely have any shadow on there and then put this back in perspective like you know put it back in into the size the correct size but this is a really cool adventure I missed the Kickstarter. It was like a year and a half ago or something like that. I wish I would have been a part of the Kickstarter, but unfortunately I wasn't. So I just picked this up recently and I thought this would be a really cool adventure to put into Fantasy Grounds. So I'm talking, well not talking, but I've put a, you know, a bug in their ear for the publisher to see if they already have someone or not doing this. And I'm asking around at Smiteworks to find out if anyone's working on it. So I think I might do the conversion of it. So I already have most of it done by the time anyone gets off the pot about it. Because it won't take long. Once you get all the images out and the maps dealt with and such, it won't be such a big thing. So anyways, you can do stuff like that to, to kind of make things easier on you uh, when you're working with this. What I really like about Canva now is like if you have an element that you're not happy with, let's just say for instance, um, like maybe you didn't like this here. You can actually go into, you can edit the photo and it has new tools that you can use to expand an image or you can edit it. I'm starting to dig into the item spell. Yeah, that that's a lot of work. That forearm monkey is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that thing too. It's pretty neat. But like this thing here, like maybe you'd put this like down here. And maybe this thing, you can place it somewhere in this image. So if you take this and squash it down a little bit, because since this is a DM map, it doesn't have to be huge. You do something like that, you know, kind of make it look nicer. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I like the monkey too. I like he's got multiple arms, but yeah, it's pretty neat. Pretty neat stuff. The music is actually part of the, the files in a sense. Like I, I ordered the music and I ordered the PDF. But like there's dice, there's like even COVID masks, there's everything that's themed. I mean, they went all out on this production. It must have cost them a fortune to do it because they did dice sets and freaking everything, man. It's, it was crazy. But there was some other things that I was looking at for running the adventure too. 
So what I did is I went through um, the content that was out for it in far as like reviews and, you know, those sort of things. And what I did is I, um, I had sought out like, okay, so there's some feedback that came back from people who had play tested it and that used Hecna. And what I did is I gone through and it's basically this, the, the, this is like the elevator pitch here. So uh, there's like an in-depth thing that I was thinking about doing, but you can integrate um, to, to make the, the adventure more interesting. You integrate the characters backstories because that was one of the weak points that was pointed out in the, um, the play test. Unfortunately, when you're doing a play test, a lot of times people don't have time to go through and read the whole adventure. So that's one benefit of reading through is that you'll notice the weak parts in an adventure and kind of make up for that. So that's part of your job or your um, tasks as a game master is to add in those things you think are missing. And you won't know that unless you read through it. So there's that. Um, so this is what um, the, 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 the area is called Revalia. And you basically have two different factions. You have people who are captured and stuck there. And then there's people who willingly went there. So this is kind of like the realm where the circus exists. It's kind of like a Ravenloft thing. And you get stuck in there. But um, basically, um, you can leverage the shuffled story. So you kind of have like a randomization on how the stories build up to the main plots. Um, and you kind of want to keep them on their toes more. I guess some of the complaints on this particular adventure was that they uh, people felt kind of bored and there wasn't much consequences in the lead up. So like if you went to attack something there, it was basically go find it, beat it up, and walk away. That works good for a one shot, but not for a, a campaign. So you need to add a little bit more depth. I think that was one of the things that someone complained about was that it wasn't varied enough and it was no consequences for doing certain things. So they suggested working on that and then weaving the backgrounds of the players into the narrative a little bit more. Um, and then also giving um, license for players to create um, events or to do things creatively to um, solve issues. So you don't always have a fight, you know, you to be a puzzle you know, so that's sort of the thing that was kind of weak that you would think would be more in the forefront since it's a circus carnival type thing. Um, they also uh, wanted you to expand on the NPC interactions. So it was kind of weak in there. And then they thought that it was a little bit thin in humor and horror. So those are just points that were made because a lot of it seemed like it was hack and slash and flash. Like you had a lot of cool art. You had a lot of cool concepts going on there, but the story part of it kind of fell apart, at least the beginning part, you know, where you lead into the adventure. I guess some people got kind of bored with it, but I got to read through it and kind of make my own opinion on it. But those are some things I'm going to be looking for when I do read it. So the dice breaker um, is basically um, shuffled stories. It's an engine that they use to utilize uh, a deck of cards for for the storytelling, which isn't a new concept. You did that in Raveloft and such, but I, I do like that. And in Fantasy Grounds, you could either use dice instead of um, the cards, or you can use the extension, the deck, card deck extension, and, you know, come up with the graphics for the cards and do that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, encouraging problem solving, adapting the campaign to fit your needs, modifying the encounters to kind of make them more interesting. You know? So those are just things that I had uh, come up with. So I have all these tips for, for um, initially anyways, I have some tips for running the adventure. However, I got to make my own opinion because this is based off of other reviews and chat GPT. So this is just giving me a starting point of the things to keep in mind. Um, but it's better to read through it before you listen to everyone else because it, you may not agree with some of their assessments. So it kind of depends. But um, one of the things that or a couple things about this adventure that I thought was really cool is you get this font. So there is a custom font that's free that you download. And that's what I used for, let's see, what did I do that on 
for this thing here. This stuff here is actually a font. So it's not just symbols, it's actually a font. So you can use their, their font system. And then they have their own language. Actually, whoever did this spent a lot of time. I mean, this had to have taken a couple years of planning. This was not just your run of the mill uh, production here. They went all out. Like, just for example, yeah, heck, the dings. <laughs> so they went all out. Like, there's the cartouches. These are the symbols that are in the, uh, for the font. So you actually download a font and use that. And then they tell you, like, how this stuff works, how the symbols work, and using them in the game. And then they have their own gobbledygook language. So, for instance, the literal translation uh, is watch your, watch your own booth means mind your own business. What the actual wording is, Beagle Yon Dogus, like Dogus, like it has their own little like slang. Like, uh, do to me crux, like don't cross me or don't screw me over. So they have all like their own language, which is crazy. I've, I haven't seen anyone do that. That's, that's a lot of work. There's original numbers, like, and then they have their gobbledygook language for, for, uh, you know, for their role playing and such. So if you were a good game master, you'd learn some of the stuff incorporate it. Yeah, it is. This is not something you would find in a normal uh, game. And then they have translation, like common word is steak, but the gobbledygook equivalent is chum. Uh, the common name for troublemaker is uh, jubblegoon. So they have their own words for stuff. So that is a lot of freaking work. I mean, look at that. That's several pages of translations and language. That Here's some pronouns. So I is eyes. You is ya or you. He is John. She is Jenny. They is thems or I use themins. <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty crazy. That That's a lot of extra really didn't have to. It even got to be the verbs conjugation. So whoever... <laughs> whoever did the languages uh this was crazy so my hat's off to you that's a lot of dedication there that that's a ton of extra doesn't necessarily have to happen but you're going all out so and then there's like these corruption mechanics which i really like and these are the stages that happens i mean you the transition between different phases and these snozzling things are, are crazy. They like they attach to you. They're kind of like a flea or like a bed bug or something like that. And they they uh, they attach to you. They insert uh, their legs into your eye sockets. And if you're careful, um, you got to be careful because it might puncture your eye. But it uses the two legs in the corners of your mouth. And then the victims, it stretches into a permanent grin. So these snozzling things help corrupt their victims, which is really creepy. But yeah, this is yeah, this is really weird. Like fresh thrall, a mangy thrall, and then a feral thrall. So these are the forms of corruption. So when you stay too long in the world, it, it really it does stuff to you. So that's clown corruption. And then there's some uh, you know some basic there's spells that are part of this like you know, unique spells, there's unique magic items, there's, you know, just all kinds of stuff. This thing is kind of never ending. It's got tons of content. It's totally worth it. This thing's like 300 pages. So if you're going to do a conversion for this, uh, it's a lot of work and dedication, let me tell you. Um, it would probably take me about a month to do this, even with using chat GPT and all the little tricks and stuff I've learned. There's just so much to it, and you'd have to build tables, and, you know, it's crazy. But this is a really neat product. I didn't want to do a product review, but it's really hard for me not to because it's such a good um, way to build an adventure. I mean, if I was going to do something like that, that would be the way I would do it. I mean, just the music is cool. Like, 
you have your soundtrack for it. And they even gave me like, um, like when I first started messing with it, like I went into the, it's called Hecna's Hellish Howlings. And when you go in here, they got a license that you can use to stream. So you just put attribution in your thing like I'm doing for this show. And then there's loops too. So if you want to play a loop over and over and over, you could do that. And if you know what you're doing in Fantasy Grounds, you could essentially import the audio, assign it some sort of trigger in Fantasy Grounds, and then play that as you go through. So there's the Forest of Forever the Jolly Jamboree loop, the Hostile Hostel, the Big Top loop. So these are just different loops that you could play during gameplay that would just kind of play over and over until you move on to the next location. So these are keyed for different parts of the adventure. So let's see the Tunnel of Love loop. So let's see what that sounds like. Oh, cool. It's kind of like the classic... Put your head on my shoulders... <laughs> yeah, I won't quit my day job. But that's the Tunnel of Love loop. And then let's see if we can find that in, in the um, in the PDF. Did I close it? That's silly. <laughs> Let's see if we can find the tunnel of love. Uh, let's do a control F. There we go. There it is, chapter 16. Yep, here we go. So you even got some role-playing notes. It says, Hecta is fresh from the torture of Pinky and is in a much better mood, despite still missing the stick. However, some of his playful pretense has dropped, letting more frantic cruelty show through. He wants to show off his power and control. Hecta wants the party to understand what happens to people like Cicero, uh, who tries to stand against him. So this is kind of like a, a confrontation in the Tunnel of Love. And then there was a map that went with it. And here's Cicero. So yeah, pretty cool, man. It's really neat. Like here's some artwork that comes from the Tunnel of Love. It looks like this big bloated cancerous heart. I love it. And then here's the, the map I was telling you about. Yeah, this is neat. Really neat stuff. So I would love to have this because you got all the visuals, you got the music, you know, you got all that stuff. If you want to spend some extra time, there you go. But yeah, anyway, so that's Hecna in a nutshell. I kind of wanted to share that with you, but the main issue here is, is to get these images out and to figure out what you want to do with them creatively and um, preemptively. So when you're adding these into Fantasy Grounds, it's easier. I mean, I think I would be spending probably almost five days of just working on images. So, I mean, that means organizing them, renaming them, resizing them, reformatting them, putting them in organized folders, and then putting it in Fantasy Grounds. Not just dumping a bunch of images and hoping for the best, because that doesn't work well, especially with a large project. When you got a large project like this, that will definitely be problematic in the long run. Short term, it's great. But in the long term, when you're trying to connect all those images in Fantasy Grounds, that'll be a problem. The other thing is like, for instance, if I was gonna build this, maybe I, I will start a new folder. So what I'm gonna do is call this Hecna, and then underscore 5e so I know what rule set or I might put 5e in the beginning just so I have a sort method and then um, put work so this is the work folder this is not where I would play the game 
So this would be more like, this is where I'm going to set everything up and I'm going to have it on LAN so I don't need to worry about a password. And the only two extensions I use for conversion work, if at all, is I'll use one of the fonts from the Forge and then I'll use the leather theme because I'm used to it and it's light, but it's not too dark and you know, it's so that's basically uh, when you start a new campaign to build content, that's what you do. So you make a separate campaign that is not your play folder. And if you want to play in this work, let's say you only have half of it done, you can make a copy of the entire campaign folder, give it a different name, load that copy up and use that as your play playtime and use this thing here as your work folder because when you're done you're going to export this as a module or you might do it in sections or something like that but you want to build all that stuff in a separate campaign if you're building as you're going that's fine but just remember you're going to run into issues later where if you load up content that you've exported or your game gets broken then you also lose all your work too so that's kind of why we you know why they ask that you make a work folder um, when you're building content. It's way cleaner and less risk. And the other thing I do, if, if possible, is like this is my working Fantasy Grounds, and then I have a play. So on one computer, it's all just for converting and working and, you know, building. The other computer is for using extensions and, you know, all that crap. So and you have a separate work environment, you're less likely gonna have the issue. So if your game crashes or you got an extension that's breaking on you, you have a whole nother setup for that. You know, so that that's kind of a, if you're really gonna get into doing conversions and development, I recommend that you have a, comp if you can ha handle it, if you can afford it, have a completely separate system because that, that way you're not breaking anything. And do not update Fantasy Grounds until you are done with your project. That's another thing is I would make sure I was completely done with it and export it as a module, load it in Fantasy Grounds. And if it breaks then, then go back to the original, do some changes, wait for some things to get fixed, whatever, work on it, re-export it, load it, test it again. That's the best way to do it. That's the best case scenario. And it sounds, you know, rather convenient, but that's basically the best way to handle it. Otherwise, you're going to paint yourself into a corner in some cases. You've, let's say you put a whole, like, six months into something, and then Fantasy Realms breaks, and you're trying to navigate that on top of the work that you have to do. I don't think so. I've been caught so many times by doing that that I, I've learned not to do that. So I've just kind of make my own separate environment for developing it doesn't get updated it doesn't have a bunch of extensions doesn't have a bunch of crap the only stuff that's part of it is what you're working on so like all this hecna graphics would go in it that's it no extra maps and extra tokens and art packs and all other crap unless you need it so that's kind of where i'm at on on development i think it's a a little bit smarter way to do it especially if you do this for a living or you're you know a full-time developer or you're doing this for extra income just save yourself the headache get yourself a different computer just for building stuff or a separate um, environment maybe you have a separate boot drive or whatever but use that as your secondary session you know you can just make a, a completely different session or, or a um, campaign which is what most people do but you have all that extra overhead and all those extra things that you've added in over the years and months so you gotta be careful with that um that's some good advice there so if you ever do that you know that's something you want to look at the other thing i might do with this is since this is a hecna thing is maybe i'll use that image for i'll make a decal so let's just say um, instead of having this Smiteworks one, maybe what I'll do is I'll go back into Canva and I'll make something like this as my decal. And then there's some elements in there 
that you can use to uh, they're like torn pages so here's a tear we'll do a, a torn or tear asset not a tear a teared torn page yeah I hate English it's got a weird <laughs> okay so this is kind of what I was saying so you can take something like this and kind of use this as a way to give you that kind of torn look maybe not quite so drastic there but you get the idea that you know you can use stuff like this and then what I might do is expand that out a little more yeah so I want a little bit more of the picture but you can use stuff like this to help give you that edge that you might be looking for. Like this thing here, I might take this and turn it 90 degrees and use this as another form of a tear and then bring that back a little. So you can do stuff like that too, just so you know, so you know. But I don't think I would use that one per se. I'd use the same one. I'd use this one again but just turn it the other way, 90 degrees. So that way it kind of matches. And then you could do something like that. And then take this and move that over. Just stuff like that. You'll get more proficient with whatever tools that, that's another thing about doing those type of hobbies. The tools that it takes to, to do this stuff it could take a while to get used to how it works, the limitations, you know, how much effort you want to put in. So something like that. I might do something like that to make my decal uh, background. And then what I would do is export this. So if I, this is page five. So what I might do is say, um, Hecna. Hecna. And I might say decal. Actually, I'm going to lead it with that. So decal underscore Hecna. That way, when you have this asset in Fantasy Grounds, you can find it easier. Because that's a pain in the butt if you have to go and look for that. And then I might use the logo. So let me go to my uploads. Maybe I'll use this original instead of the... Yeah, I'll use that. So I probably will use this as a way to kind of announce the product, but without the the other logo is nice, but it doesn't fit the aesthetic. And then of course I'll put this bit behind. There we go. So you do something like that to kind of give you the the title without kind of making it blend in more with this. And then once you have this you know, whatever you want to call it. So this is S-C-K-N-A. Okay, decal underscore Hecna. So I'm going to go ahead and hit share. I'm going to go to download. And then I'm only going to download page five. And then if you had transparency back there, you can tell it to do that. But in this case, I don't. So I'll just hit this and to download and then what you can do is add another page add that actual image back into this and do other stuff to it so let me go and see if I can find it where did it go so yeah that that's uh pretty neat what they did here with this I like how they they did the soundtrack, which is really cool. Here's the, the Jolly Jamboree. And I'll put a loop on it. Okay, so going back to looking for the image. Home. Okay, so here's the image. So I'll drag that back in here. 
Okay, so now that it's one image, now I can take this and use that tool that I was telling you about, the um, editing tool. Or you can put it in GIMP if you want. So, you know, the background remover. See if that actually takes all that white out. Does that's what I was trying to do. No, 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 not that. That's not what I was trying to do. Yeah, it's not exactly what I wanted. So, what I'd probably use it in GIMP. So, again, I would just go into GIMP, take that image, drop it into GIMP or a similar program, and then you go to Layer, Transparency. Make sure it has an alpha channel, that way you can remove this stuff out easier. Once that happens in GIMP, now you they call it, this is called a fuzzy select tool, but it might be called something else. And you can click on it and you can change how aggressive it is. So right now I have the threshold at 50%, but I think I want to go down about 40. Because what happens, it'll grab too much. You don't want that. So let's see. Yeah, so let's see, it took out a majority of that, which is what I wanted. So now you could take this and export it and use this as your your decal. So I go to file export as it says decal underscore hecna. So I'm gonna change this to WebP because it's probably a pretty good size image. Web P hit export and now image quality is going to be 75 percent and i'll hit export all right so let's see what it looks like okay so this file is it's not written yet what's it doing It's probably still tied up in the program because I have it. Let me get out of this. Okay, that might be why. Yeah, so this is 329 kilobytes. The original image was almost six megs. So that's a difference in the compression. So let's see what this looks like now that I've converted it. And at this point, you can, you know, edit the, if you wanted to. I probably would have edited the flat version of this, but that's how it turned out. So it's pretty good. Not bad. So see, it took off all these rough edges. So now when you put this into Fantasy Grounds, it'll look a lot cooler. So let's do that. So hit copy. So if you haven't done this yet in Fantasy Grounds, it's best to get all your images um, organized. So in this case, I probably should take this and move it into here, because this is where I keep the art, the main art. And then I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and I'll be in Fantasy Grounds. Let me turn the music down. So in Fantasy Grounds, um, if you want to change this background, you know, you can't change the whole theme, just this image. So if you go to the uh, options and you go to background decal, you can clear it or you can pick some of the ones that they provide you. So once you hit clear, that'll get rid of it. Um, I also want to change my pointer color to like a yellow so I can do that. And then what I'll do is I'm going to go to library assets and then make sure you're clicked on images and then you want to click on folder because that'll take you to the back end where the images folder is and I'm gonna make a subfolder here this is something you want to do if you're gonna have a, a big project so I'm gonna put decals back here because I might make more than one and then I'm just gonna Put that in here 
And then whenever you make changes, whether you move a file or you rename it or you delete it or whatever you do, you want to hit this refresh. And now I have a folder called campaign. And here's a decal folder or subfolder. And this is kind of like your preview. So at this point, I can make it a quick map. I can share it with my players. I can make a map record or I can set it as a background decal. So I'll go ahead and do that. So that's what it looks like. So that's a little big and obnoxious, but I do like it. Looks pretty cool. Then what I would do is for dice to make my table kind of match the, the series here is first of all, I'd probably instead of using the leather theme, I'd probably use the forest theme because it's got like yellowish colors in it. So, or something a little bit less uh, like this, but this isn't bad. And then what I'll do is I'll go to the dice and kind of theme it around the colors of the decal. So uh, if you come down, I don't know if I want any of these really complex ones like this one here, maybe I'll see. So you take like, for instance, the body can be like this yellow color. So if you go here and you take the eyedropper, you can kind of put it on here and use that as your base color. And then you have to click OK. And then for the text color, I might use that reddish color for the text. So there you go. So now you kind of have themed dice for the campaign. You know, I don't know if I'd necessarily use that, maybe something more solid. Yeah, so... I don't know. I've kind of got mixed mixed bag on that, but this might just be something like that where it's more plain. Because if you look at the actual um, product page, let's see, go to Hecna. Let's see. They have this really cool popcorn bag with dice and stuff in it. So. So if you, here's their little dice set. So that's kind of, I mean, I don't have the clown face, but that's sort of what, that's pretty neat actually. But anyway, so this is like hot butter popcorn. How much is that dice set? 25 bucks. This might be, if you're really into it. And then you got little figures and everything. So anyway, so I might take something like these and make, um, Images in chat GPT. So just use this as a framework and just put that in there and tell chat GPT to describe it and then get kind of close to what these things look like. And Or if you get the STL files, you can use this to kind of help you, um, you know, create content. But anyway, so this, this is kind of, you know, getting out into the weeds here. But you get the idea that, you know, you can theme stuff. So that's why... I chose to have the dice like this because it kind of looks like the dice that comes with the the with the uh, dice set. So this is just kind of a way to make things a little bit neater. And then, like I said, all the frames and stuff can't do much about that unless you load a different extension. So let me try that. So I'm going to go out for a moment, go to load campaign instead of using the leather theme. Actually, the Baron theme would probably work well since it's kind of a dark kind of blood red. But I want to try the, the wood. So I know that one kind of has more yellows and stuff in it and more natural colors. So that might work. But the Baron theme actually or the default Fantasy Grounds theme might actually work better. But it is too dark. So that's the only thing I could say or, or a lot darker than I'd want. But you have to play around with the themes that are available right now. And I hope that SmiteWorks gets more themes eventually because um, I think that's an important thing, especially if you're going to stream online like this. It would be nice to have a little bit more variety in color. And I kind of wish that there was a way that you can recolor some of the main elements with the color picker tool. So kind of like build your own at least color scheme. I kind of have like a shell where some things can't be changed, but others can. But then people complain, oh, the, yeah, so I like this a little bit better. Uh, yeah, this so this is a little closer to what I would want for this game. So if I was going to run this campaign, I would definitely use that. And in this case, I would only load the SRD 
That's all I would need for for inputting content. And then I might change a couple options, but really it'd be kind of a clean slate. Wouldn't need to do a whole lot with this because this would be like your your test campaign, so or your work campaign. So that's just some things you can do to kind of work with images and fantasy grounds and make things more interesting. So I think I'm going to call it a night. Hopefully that was a little bit helpful, not too much rambling, but you know, kind of give you some ideas of some of the things you can do. And I will have some of these tools at the end of the video, some links for the resources that I use, including Hecna. Um, and I want to see if anyone's, if anyone's working on this, let me know, send me a message. Cause I think this is a really cool adventure. It would go over really well. Um, and I think that it would, it would look good in fantasy grounds. And I know this publisher already has stuff on the store or somebody related to it. So it wouldn't be that big of a deal. It's just getting someone to do the work, which is a lot. It would take me over a month probably to do it. But, you know, if anyone's working on this already, send me a message because I don't want to waste my time. But anyways, take care, folks. Have a good night. Uh, tomorrow's Friday. Uh, tune in to Fantasy Grounds Fridays with Bryce and such tomorrow. And tomorrow evening, I'm going to do another stream going back to the conversion for the um, Lost